Well, good morning. Let me invite you to take a copy of God's Word and to turn or scroll to the book of Zephaniah. If you're wondering where Zephaniah is, it's after Habakkuk. As you're turning there, if I've not had a chance to meet you yet, my name is Nathan Finn. I serve as teaching pastor here at Taylor's First Baptist Church. Our family has been here uh, just since January, and uh, we love this congregation. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to lead us today as we continue our series, Summer in the Minors. I was tempted to wear a minor league jersey today. I thought about it, and then I was told I would be the former teaching pastor at Taylor's First Baptist Church if I did that, and so I opted not to. I'm just kidding. Nobody told me that, but I know what's what, so, uh, so here we are today. If you've turned to Zephaniah, let me invite you to look at the back, Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. We're going to use these verses today. It's kind of our jumping off point. Zephaniah 3, 14 through 17. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you today for your word. It's a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. We thank you for the chance that we've had to worship you already this morning through singing and through prayer and through the public reading of scripture together. And now we pray that you would help us to worship you by hearing and responding to your word. Our prayer this morning is that the same Holy Spirit who inspired these words, would help us to rightly understand them and apply them to our lives for our good and for your glory. And as the preacher this morning, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So what comes to your mind whenever you think of the great gospel passages in the Bible. Maybe John 3.16 comes to mind. That would be a pretty obvious one to go to. Or maybe you think of some of those really noteworthy passages in the letters of Paul where he talks about the atonement and justification and the resurrection and conversion. Or maybe... You think about all of those wonderful summaries of the gospel that we find in the book of Acts. If you've been here with us for a while, you know that we've spent many months in the book of Acts. And at the conclusion of this summer series, I think we'll be returning to Acts later this fall. All really good places to go to the Bible and to find the gospel. But what about the book of Zephaniah? What about the book of Zephaniah? Though it was written 600 years or so years before the life of Jesus, Zephaniah offers one of the most powerful gospel messages that we find in all of Scripture, Old Testament or New Testament. In fact, one Old Testament scholar calls it the John 3.16 of the Old Testament. The gospel is that clear. And so for that reason, I've titled this sermon, The Gospel According to Zephaniah. Because this whole book is what we might think of as a prophetic gospel tract for us to understand the good news. And this morning we're going to discuss three gospel themes that we find throughout the book of Zephaniah. But before we do that, I want to do 
for a couple of minutes what we've done every other week and provide just a little bit of introductory information about who this guy, Zephaniah, is and what he's trying to do with his book. So a little bit of background here. Zephaniah served as a prophet to the southern kingdom of Judah near the end of the 31-year reign of Josiah. If you remember anything about this time period, uh, this would have been a couple of generations after the northern kingdom of Israel had been exiled because of their sin, and it was just a few decades before the southern kingdom would also be exiled for similar reasons. Josiah, who was the ruler at this time, was a devout king. He wanted Judah to return to God and to recommit to God's teachings that we find in what we call the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Josiah wanted Israel to recommit themselves to the Lord by taking that word seriously. So Zephaniah's original readers would have been a group of Jewish individuals who had recently experienced revival, at least in the past couple of decades had experienced revival. But those fires, it's clear from this book, were now beginning to grow cold. And Israel was starting to once again drift away from her God. Now, we don't know a whole lot about Zephaniah, but we can make two reasonable guesses about him based upon the text. So I admitted it. These are guesses, but they're reasonable guesses. First, Zephaniah's name in Hebrew means the Lord has hidden or protected. And so many scholars think that he was probably born to a very devout family during the reign of Josiah's father, Manasseh who was one of the most wicked kings of Judah. It's a reasonable guess. Second, the book begins with a brief genealogy, the only time this happens with a minor prophet. And that never happens in Scripture unless you're someone important. And so many scholars believe that that might indicate that Zephaniah was a part of the extended royal family, might have had a personal connection with King Josiah. Again, we don't know that for sure, but it's a reasonable guess because that genealogy is there in Josiah chapter 1, verse 1. Now, we've seen throughout the Minor Prophets this summer that a major recurring theme is the day of the Lord, that future day when God will judge all people because of their works. And even though Zephaniah, the book, is only three chapters, it talks about the day of the Lord more than any of the other minor prophets. It is the major theme of this particular book. But while all the minor prophets talk about the coming day of judgment, not only does Zephaniah Zephaniah talk more about that than the others, but he also spends more time talking more clearly about God's promised blessings. For those who flee judgment and turn from their sins and trust the Lord. And so that's going to bring us to the very first key gospel theme that we see this morning in the book of Zephaniah. We all deserve God's judgment because of our sin. We all deserve God's judgment because of our sin. Let's look again at Zephaniah chapter 1 verses 2 through 6 where God threatens to judge his people. Zephaniah 1, verses 2 through 6. I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away man and beast. I will sweep away the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea and the rubble with the wicked. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will stretch out my hand against Judah, And against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I will cut off from this place the remnant of Baal. And the name of the idolatrous priests along with the priests. Those who bow down on the roofs to the host of the heavens. Those who bow down and swear to the Lord. And yet also swear by Milcom. Those who have turned back from following the Lord. Who do not seek 
the Lord or inquire of him. Think about these words for just a minute. The God who created the world and everything in it, including humans, threatens to sweep all of that away. Every bit of it. And the reason is because his chosen people are turning from their covenant with him and they are worshiping false gods. He even names some of those false gods that they're worshiping in these verses. It's a serious stuff. Then if we were to read a little bit further down in this chapter, in verses 7 through 18, Zephaniah gives us an extended discussion of what judgment is going to look like at the day of the Lord. Now for the sake of time, we're not going to read all of those verses, but I do want us to look together at verses 17 and 18, which kind of bring a close to this discussion about the day of the Lord. I will bring distress on mankind so that they shall walk like the blind. Because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them on the day of the wrath of the Lord. In the fire of his jealousy all the earth shall be consumed. For a full and sudden end he will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. Now, we know Israel is going to, excuse me, Judah is going to be exiled in just a few years after this. But the language in these passages that we've just read seems too strong and too comprehensive to only be referring to the Babylonian exile that was to come just a few decades later. The prophet is looking further ahead. And he is speaking of a judgment that's far worse than a military defeat or an enemy occupation. Those things are right around the corner. And this same theme is going to continue into Zephaniah 2. When he turns his attention away from either Judah in particular or kind of mankind in general. And he begins to speak specifically to non-Jewish nations the other peoples that were around Judah. Now, we aren't going to read all of these verses in Zephaniah 2, but I want to give you a list of the godless nations that he mentions in this chapter. In verse 4, he mentions Gaza, Ashkelon, Ashdod, and Ekron. In verse 5, he mentions the Cherethites and the Philistines. In verse 8, he mentions the Moabites, and the Ammonites. In verse 12, he mentions the Cushites. And in verse 13, he mentions Assyria. If we were to pull up a map of ancient Israel during this time, that's all the different nations that surround Israel, or what's left of Israel, in the Middle East and North Africa. And then here's what the prophet says is going to happen to all of those pagan nations in verse 11. The Lord will be awesome against them, for he will famish all the gods of the earth, and to him shall bow down, each in its place, all the lands of the nations. All these pagan nations that surround Judah in that part of the world will bow down to the Lord. And the language here makes clear they will not be bowing to the Lord in reverent faith. They'll be bowing to the Lord in routed fear because he will have utterly destroyed his enemies. Then we come to Zephaniah chapter 3, the first eight verses. And we find that drifting Judah that had been discussed in chapter 1 and the pagan nations that had been discussed in chapter 2 are lumped together. As God continues to further announce the doom that awaits all those who persist in their sinful rejection of him and his ways. Let's read the Lord's final summary statement of his judgment in chapter 3, verse 8. Therefore wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day when I rise up to seize the prey. For my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out upon them my indignation, 
all my burning anger. For in the fire of my jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. So what are we to make of all these verses about God's judgment? Well, let me offer three brief observations from really the first two and a half chapters of Zephaniah. First, we need to understand that God threatens judgment both to religious hypocrites who are just going through the motions spiritually and to what we might call committed unbelievers who've never professed to love God or to worship Him. Religious hypocrites and committed unbelievers may look very different because of their differing context. After all, one is around the body of Christ, professing to believe certain things, has certain habits. The other... Not even pretending. But what matters is that their hearts are the same. They reject the God who created them. And to whom they ought to be bowing down before. As king and savior. Friends, Greenville County is filled with hundreds of thousands. Of spiritually lost men and women who fit into both of these categories. Phony Christians. Who are playing at religion, and committed unbelievers who worship false gods or no gods at all. Every individual story is unique, of course, but our spiritual status always boils down to only two options. Either we're authentic believers whose sins have been forgiven by God through faith in Jesus Christ, Or were unbelievers of some sort who stand apart from God and who remain captive to our sin. Second, we need to see that Zephaniah and all the minor prophets are concerned with both the sin of individuals and the widespread sin of all peoples. This is a recurring theme in the minor prophets. Most of us in this room more than likely have grown up in the U.S., And in the U.S., our worldview is profoundly shaped by a commitment to individual autonomy, personal rights, freedom and democracy. And there's a lot of great things about that. But most ancient cultures emphasized the community, not just individuals. And many other cultures in our world today greatly emphasize whole communities and not just individuals and individual families. Scripture, including Zephaniah, offers us a balance, emphasizing both individuals and communities. Or if you want to think about it this way, both people and peoples. And this is especially true when we're speaking of sin. Though it might sound countercultural to many of us, we need to hear the warning of all the prophets that Zephaniah is really zeroing in on today. Entire nations are judged by God because of the cumulative sins of the people who make up those nations. The prophets are clear about that. In Scripture, not only does your sin matter, but our sins matter. Brothers and sisters, this should be a wake-up call in a nation where so many desire abortion on demand, where so many celebrate various forms of sexual immorality and perversion, where so many tolerate various types of injustice towards various types of minorities, where so many treat greed as virtue where so many turn a deaf ear to those who are trapped by crippling poverty. Not only does sin matter, our sins collectively matter. Finally, we need to understand that sin and its consequences are far worse than we make it out to be sometimes. God doesn't speak of Judah here and the nations as messing up or not being perfect 
falling a little short. The language about sin is sweeping and it's sobering. God is perfectly holy and human sin is an affront to his holiness and a rejection of his just rule over his creatures. The consequences of that sin include covenantal separation from God, conflict with other people, chaos in the created order, and ultimately eternal condemnation in a place that is so horrific, the image that the New Testament writers come up with is a lake of everlasting fire. Friends, I know this is really strong stuff. And it's certainly out of step with the spirit of our age. But one test of whether we take God and his word seriously is whether we take seriously the reality and gravity and consequences of sin. God promises terrible, awful judgment upon sinners of every stripe and type. So how should we respond to this awful reality? That brings us to the second point, second gospel theme that we see in Zephaniah today. We should each respond to threatened judgment by repenting of our sin. We should each respond to threatened judgment by repenting of our sin. Let's read again Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Gather together. Yes, gather, O shameless nation, before the decree takes effect, before the day passes away like chaff, before there comes upon you the burning anger of the Lord, before there comes upon you the day of the anger of the Lord. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, who do his just commands. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. Perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. These verses are a wake-up call to Judah. The prophet urges all the people to come together before it's too late, before God's burning anger against sin boils over into judgment. This is a corporate call recognizing that the entire nation has an opportunity to turn to God in repentance. And the result, if that happened, would be spiritual awakening for Judah, covenant renewal for that nation. But then the prophet also encourages those who are humble, those who desire to live lives of godly obedience. He encourages them as individuals to seek the Lord. They are to repent of their sins and trust God alone. So this is not just a corporate call to the nation. It's an individual call. Recognizing that God might choose to deliver individual men and women who turn to him. Even if the nation as a whole remains in rebellion. And he moves against them in judgment. He might spare a remnant. Those individuals who are following him instead of the ways of the world. Again, the language in these verses echoes the minor prophets. In Amos chapter 5, verses 5 and 6, he twice calls for the people to seek the Lord and live. Zephaniah uses that language. Micah chapter 6, verse 8 says, He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your Lord. Zephaniah uses some language like that. Not just the minor prophets, we find this language in the major prophets. I'll just give you one example. Very familiar verse in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 6. He says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. The persistent We may even say in some ways, relentless message of the prophets is that God's judgment upon sin is going to come. It will happen. But there remains a chance for some. Those 
humble enough to use Zephaniah's language to look to God alone for deliverance from their sin and its consequences. Why was it that God is so patient with these Jewish idolaters? I mean, I know in our culture, what people would tend to say is, why is God so mean? But I hope we're immersed enough in scriptures that we're willing to say, why is God so patient? Why is he so patient with these idolaters who pay him lip service while their hearts are far from him? Why does he give them chance after chance to repent and to turn to him? To make it more personal, why does he deal that way with us? Why is he so patient with us? Why does he give us opportunity after opportunity to turn from our sin and trust him? That brings us to our final gospel theme that we see in Zephaniah. The same God who judges sin also loves sinners and promises salvation to all those who turn to him in faith. Let me say that one more time. The same God who judges sin also loves sinners and promises salvation to all who turn to him in faith. One of my best friends wrote a commentary on the book of Zephaniah. We were texting about this a couple of days ago, and the way he said it is this. This is in a text, not in his commentary. The first two and a half chapters of Zephaniah is some of the worst stuff in the Bible. While the last half of chapter 3 is some of the best stuff in the Bible. So let's read this good news. Let's start with Zephaniah 3 verses 9 through 13. For that time I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech. That all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, the daughter of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. On that day you shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove from your midst your proudly exultant ones, and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. But I will leave in your midst a people humble and lowly. They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord, those who are left in Israel." They shall do no injustice and speak no lies, nor shall there be found in their mouth a deceitful tongue. For they shall graze and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. This is a remarkable image of salvation. And it both calls back to earlier things that we've seen in Scripture, and it points forward to things that are to come. God promises to purify the speech of the people so that with one accord... They'll call upon his name and serve him. This is a gracious reversal of what he did at the Tower of Babel. When in judgment, he confused the language of the people. When with one accord, they were rebelling against him. God promises salvation to both faithful Jews and believing Gentiles. This points back to the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis chapter 12 and chapter 17, where God promises that, All the families of the earth will be blessed by Abraham and his descendants. It also points forward to the promise in Revelation chapter 7 that a great multitude from every tribe and tongue and nation will worship the Lord around his throne at the end of the age. God promises the removal of all sin and everlasting peace for his people. This points forward to the new creation which Isaiah prophesies about in Isaiah chapter 65 and 66, and that the Apostle John foresees in Revelation chapter 21 and chapter 22. And this glorious vision of Judah's future and our future is rooted in the love of God. Let's return where we started to Zephaniah 3, 14 through 17. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. 
The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion. Let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. These are some of the most beautiful verses in all of Scripture. God loves us so much that he conquers sin and death. Taking away the judgment that he's promised and that we deserve. The imagery is of God singing and shouting in celebration over us. This is marriage language. In Jewish culture, this is a groom celebrating his bride after the wedding has taken place. I love what the great 19th century Baptist preacher Charles Spurgeon says about verse 17. Think of the great Jehovah singing. Can you imagine it? Is it possible to conceive of the deity breaking forth into a song? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together singing over the redeemed. God is so happy in the love He bears to His people that He breaks the eternal silence. And sun and moon with astonishment hear God chanting a hymn of joy over us. Over us. Friends, listen closely. No matter what you've done, God loves you. And He was willing, He longs to forgive your sin. He delights in you so much that He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, into this world. And Jesus lived the perfectly obedient life that every one of us are commanded to live and none of us ever do. And he died the horrible criminal death upon a cross that all of us deserve for our sins. But none of us have to endure. And he was raised into new life of everlasting flourishing that is promised to every one of us, if we turn from our sins, trust Jesus alone as our King and our Savior, if we do that, He is faithful to forgive our sins, to adopt us into His forever family, and to give us an everlasting life of flourishing that begins now and continues in to the next life. God promises judgment upon Sin. And because God loves sinners, He has provided a means of escape. And this is the best news you are ever going to hear. So I want to close today with just one final point of application flee the coming judgment. By turning from your sins and trusting Jesus Christ alone as your King and your Savior. For most of us here, this is a call to spiritual renewal. To repent of whatever drift is in our life. To return to the one who has already saved us. Martin Luther, the great reformer, says that Jesus' call to repentance is the beginning of a lifetime of repentance. For most of us here today, that's the call. Repent and return, whatever that means for you. But for some of us here today, this might be a call to repent for the very first time. In just a moment, we're going to I'm going to pray and then we're going to stand and we're going to sing a closing song. Some of our pastors will be in the back. If you're here today and all of this is new, 
or if it's really just connecting in your heart for the very first time, let me urge you to not leave this place before you turn from your sin and you trust Jesus as your King and Savior and you experience this love of God, a singing and shouting love in your life for His glory and your good. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this reminder from your word that sin is real and it is awful. But oh Lord, how grateful we are for the even greater reminder that you love sinners. That you love us. That you want to free us from our sin. That you want to forgive us. That you want to adopt us into your forever family. Lord, this is good news. And may it be the good news that encourages all of us who already believe today. And may it be the good news that changes lives for those who do not yet believe today. Lord, help us to respond in these next few moments, however you are leading us, for our good and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.